Hello everyone, my name is Emily Elliott. I am the assistant professor of sculpture here at SRU. Today I have with me Jack Honeyset of Hi. Allegheny College. So this year's project prompt is called the personal object. This project aims to create object empathy through creative actions of repair, hybridization, or combination. Uh, you will begin with the human body and found objects as a departure point, uh, allowing those different objects to inform your design for the project. And you should all have with you um, the outline, the brief for the project. Um, but you're working towards something that's gonna be on public display, and there's a couple of parameters um, for that, you know, because we're going to have a lot of people in this exhibition who are going to be clamoring to show their pieces as part of Sculpture X. Um, now, what we are going to go through today in this video is the outline of the prompt and give a couple of ideas and suggestions about how you might, what you want to use as the starting point for your prompt, but also a couple of methods to help get you there or get you off the line, as it were. And we'll do a couple of demos for a few different techniques of mold making, um, taking that initial form from your body. Like we said, for this project, you're going to want to consider three different ideas. The first one being, like we said, the human body. Uh, you will want to consider how are you going to capture the human form? Are you going to, you know, shine a bright light and capture a silhouette? Are you going to actually I'm counting. Oh. I'm, counting I'm counting. I'm giving a little. That's the. That's one way. That's that one gonna, way. That's uh, one way we're going to show you in this video. Are you going to do live casting, where you're actually taking the data and form off of a live model, uh, or are you going to, you know, use traditional sculpting practices? Um, you know, perhaps you're. Uh, you have a certain affinity with clay, all of which can be utilized to use that human form as a departure point. The second thing you're going to want to consider are pre-existing found objects. Uh, you know, since the time of Duchamp, found objects have been included in three-dimensional forms in one way or the other. So you want to carefully consider which found object you're going to uh, collect, utilize, change, alter in the production of your finished piece of artwork. And then finally, the third thing you want to consider is how do you transform both of these objects through the act of making? Um, you know, are you going to alter or change those objects uh, in the act of combining them together? Are you going to, you know, repair one object with the other? Are you going to, uh, you know, completely transform what they originally were into, you know, a new, completely different third thing? And what we want our Sculpture X participants to really be working on is synthesizing these three parameters, the human body, found objects, and then transforming them through making meaning. You know, what happens when we combine the organic forms that we're so used to of our own physical form with the probably human-made or other types of natural forms that are outside our body but interact with us and on you know whether it's an everyday object or it's a, whether it's a really rare unusual shape or form and how what happens when you combine those two what added meaning gets made and, and be working on synthesizing this through sculpture practice using your physical like techniques that we're going to start showing you um, to make that synthesis and really be thinking through the materials and working through the materials. So I'm going to talk to you now about the technical technical considerations and some of the vocabulary that we want to impart on you. It might be something that you've already worked with, you've already worked on a project like this before, um, but if not and these things are new, we want you to come away with, you know, some of these vocabulary in turn so that you can talk to others about sculpture so you can share some of this stuff and work as a team. Um, so we want you to think, be thinking about the shape, form, material, and design specifics of your sculpture. And that's all up to you. You have complete autonomy in this project. I'll get to where you maybe don't in a little bit. <laughs> the, the specifications um, will be, be decidedly based on 
what will work best for your concept and what you are trying to articulate to the viewer. The only guidelines are they cannot be made of living material. And we say this because it's going to be in an exhibition space um, and you're not going to be in that exhibition space the whole time, but the gallery assistants and anyone visiting probably doesn't want to smell the rotten food you've made part of your sculpture. So let's just, just be polite there. And so don't make any living material. Now I would say unless it's like already, you, you know, dried leaves may be okay, but something that isn't going to be decomposing in the gallery space. So if it gets wet and mushy like wet leaves, no. Um, the dimensions cannot exceed two feet in any dimension. Now, I would probably try and keep it a little bit smaller than this, but the maximum you can go to will be two foot in any singular dimension. There's gonna be a lot of us in this show and a lot of artworks, and it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be a crazy cacophony of all your pieces coming together um, from every school that's participating in Sculpture X. And so, can't have anyone like you know dominating the space we've got a lot of artworks to fit in the gallery here uh, and the weight of the object is limited to 50 pounds please think of anyone who has to move your sculpture make it sturdy try to make it as strong as you can because this this is going to be moved and probably installed by other people um, those of you who are around to help um, then work with your professors to work out when when it's going to be delivered to the gallery uh, and installed and set up and such like. But even so, it's probably going to have to be moved, arranged, curated in the show. So please be sensitive to other people who are working with your art. Uh, so don't make it over 50 pounds. So the design process will differ for each person, but everyone is going to begin uh, with the same departure point. You will all each individually choose how you want to capture and relate the idea of the human form. This can be done in a variety of ways. The next thing you're going to want to do is look for pre-existing objects whose inherent meaning or conceptual premise can suit the design for your project. Uh, you're going to be looking for found objects which have an inherent meaning in and of themselves, but whose inherent meaning you can sort of change, alter, hybridize, combine with your human body objects in order to change the meaning of what you're trying to create with your design. Uh, this could be in the form of, let's say, a rotary telephone, which you can then combine with life cast uh, pieces uh, that you've taken off of your actual ears. Um, this could be, you know, a... But what does it mean? But what does it mean? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. Uh, objects inherently mean something. A telephone is going to represent communication uh, with one or more individuals. Uh, however, not all communication is vocal, right? So this is a chance for us to create a completely new sculpture that is about, oh, I don't know, uh, communicating through uh, body language, right? But we're borrowing the mechanisms of communication uh, that exist for auditory, auditory communicative devices, right? So if we take body casts of human beings and then have a bunch of rotary cords strung in between them, we're sort of having two different levels of dialogue between the objects that we're actually presenting in the student exhibition. It's so bizarre. I've, I've, this entire time I've been like looking at this project and I was like, that's what I would do. I would get a bunch of rotary telephones. <laughs> <laughs> or I would make those like can sculptures with the string in between it, but I would just fill the can with plaster and plop an ear on it. All right, the third concept that you're going to want to explore is the act of making itself. Transformation through the act of making. Uh, nothing stays the same if we are enacting upon that object. So anything you do to alter the object, repair it, change it, sand it down, uh, make something more apparent, uh, or bring out the essence of whatever that 
uh, you know, idea is in the form. Anything that we do to these two objects to combine them is in and of itself going to change the meaning of the actual composition, right? So it is through the act of making that we are actually going to be transforming these two objects, even just by placing them next to each other. Here are some questions you should possibly consider during the making of your sculpture. What creates empathy? How do you spark empathy through form? How do we define empathy as it relates to objects? What part of the body connects to our capacity for empathy and relation? What objects have bodies or infer bodies? What makes us want to interact with something? How can we make inanimate objects more human? What specific materials or objects do you need to achieve your conceptual goal? What do they mean individually? What is important for your audience to walk away with in terms of meaning? And finally, how do we define transformation? How do these concepts intersect? So today we're going to do a little bit of a material demo that is going to address one of the ways that you can capture uh, information from the human body. This is one of my favorite ways to, uh, to kind of approach and or answer that question of how do I invite the human figure into a project that I'm working on. Uh, this is, uh, today we're going to be working with alginate, which if you've never heard that word before, that's totally fine. Alginate is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It is made from sea algae and you combine it with water and in doing so it kind of has a brief period of time where it is a sort of liquid almost plasma like state um, and you can actually use it to uh, paint onto the surface of an object or in this case the human body and uh, after a certain amount of time it will set up and become rigid. Um, that is one of the things that makes it an excellent mold making and or life casting material. Uh, if any of you have ever had braces before, it is the actual material that they use to take molds of your teeth. Um, so it is completely skin safe. Um, you, can, you can utilize it in a bunch of different ways and it's actually non-toxic, which in the mold making universe is kind of hard to come by. Um, so today we're gonna be using a smooth on project uh, that uh, product that is called AlgaSafe. Again, like I said, it's completely skin safe. You can use it on the human body without any sort of toxins and worries of, of, of anything like that being in the material. Um, one thing that you want to be mindful of, uh, much like working with plaster or any other kind of transformative uh, material is that there's a couple of different variables that you want to consider. Uh, one of the things that you want to consider is that you want to be mindful of the temperature of the water that you're going to be using. Uh, if you use hot water, it is going to decrease the amount of working time that you have with this material. Uh, it's the same sort of rules that apply to plaster. If you work with hot water, you have less working time. If you work with cold water, you have more working time. Now, uh, this material is going to differ in how you actually approach it uh, from plaster, which is that you're actually going to start with the powder in a container and you're going to pour water into that powder. We're not going to be doing the sprinkling and the creation of the island in the middle here. That does not apply. Uh, you want to make sure that you are always pouring water into the alginate and not the other way around. Um, now, we're also going to possibly be doing um, some different processes in terms of mixing than you've seen before. Uh, I prefer to use a mixing bit or a mixing paddle 
Um, they kind of come in a couple of different designs. Uh, these are two of them that we just have in the studio here at SRU. Um, I prefer to use those with a power drill in order to mix my material just because when I'm doing a live cast and working with a model, I like to make it as, uh, as, as quick of a process as possible so as to not make my model, you know, have to stand still for longer than they actually need to. Um, plus, you know, we're working with these transformative materials, which means that they're actively in a chemical process of transforming. Um, so you only have a finite amount of time that you can work with them when they are in that, that sort of pre-solid zone. Um, so using a power drill, using a power mixer is a way that you can speed up the mixing time. Now, that being said, we don't always have power drills and we don't always have mixing uh, spade bits. However, um, you can use a regular old mixing stick and do it the old fashioned way and do it by hand. Um, you'll have to have a lot of forearm strength and you'll have to work relatively quickly, but it is still completely and totally doable. So if you students are doing this, let's say in your home studio or I don't know, in your parents' garage, uh, you can still totally achieve similar results. Um, you just might have to work a little bit harder physically uh, and you're going to have to be mindful of the time that you're working with um, and, and just kind of be mindful of that time as it's passing. Because every moment that you're mixing is a moment that you're not actually creating the mold and you want to be creating the mold as quickly as possible. So we are going to be doing um, a mouth cast today. Uh, I like to call these bucket molds. The reason why I call them bucket molds is because you are going to be pouring the alginate material directly into the container that is going to act as your mother mold. If no one has explained to you what a mother mold is before, uh, this will uh, act as that moment. Um, for every mold making material uh, that has a little bit of flexibility, like alginate or silicone, um, you have to have a rigid material that acts as the mother mold. Uh, the reason is, is that flexible materials are exactly that. They're flexible. They're going to flap around. Um, and so that is primarily only capturing the data, aka the detail of the human body, which is great. That's what it's really good at, is capturing all of the little wrinkles, all of the little crevices that data is going to be in the alginate or in, let's say, a silicone mold if you're going that route. Um, however, it's just data. It's not the form, aka the actual uh, physical body. It's just what is on the surface level. Um, your mother mold is the thing that is rigid and sits on top of that rubber part and acts as the actual uh, rigid mold that is going to capture the form. Right, so alginate needs to have something that's, that will hug it snugly. That way we're actually able to capture the form and it won't just be flopping all over the place. So when I do alginate molds, I usually have a bucket that is just going to act as the mother mold. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be doing my mouth. So I took a Powerade bottle and sliced it using a utility knife. Uh, I'm doing that because we're gonna fill this with alginate and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna hold it up to my mouth and you know make a crazy face and hopefully capture that in the mold. Um, and then once it's actually set and we pour plaster into it, uh, we'll, this is just something I was gonna recycle anyways, so we'll be able to just cut this off and just waste it anyways, right? So I don't need to keep this um, so I can just cut it apart in pieces and still be able to demold uh, my casting. All right, now if I wanted to do my hand, let's say, I would just grab a mixing container like this or something from the dollar store uh, that can you know, easily be used and I would make this amount of alginate and I would just plunge my hand right in there. I would wait for it to set up and then I would uh, I would demold my hand and then I would be ready to pour plaster immediately into the cavity that my hand left, right? Um, so 
alginate is really great for molds like that, where if you can cobble together some slapdash way of sticking a body part into a Tupperware container, uh, then you can make an alginate mold. Uh, now you can do more complex alginate molds where you paint on alginate onto the surface of the skin, but then you have to solve the problem of how do I capture the form of the body part? And in order to do that, it needs to be rigid. So that's where you paint alginate on and then you follow it up with laying plaster bandage on top of the alginate. That plaster bandage is gonna firm up and it's gonna act as your rigid mother mold to your alginate layer that is inside of there. Um, now that poses a couple of difficulties. Uh, one of the main things being that alginate is a gloopy, you know, viscous material um, that is really, you know, not very good at defying gravity. So you wanna be mindful of all of that. If you're ever doing a face casting or something else, uh, you, you don't wanna do it upright where everything is just gonna drip down to the ground. If you can, you wanna have someone like lying on a table and have something that can catch all of the material that is gonna to wanna to fall down. Um, however, that's more advanced techniques. If you have any question about advanced techniques um, or you wanna learn more about this, I would highly recommend that you uh, discuss it with your instructor once you have gotten your hands on some alginate. All right, you guys ready? Okay, so uh, alginate can come in a couple of different colors. I don't want you to be uh, startled if your alginate looks a little bit different than my alginate. It depends on where you source it. Um, mine has kind of like a pinkish purple lavender color. Some of it just looks pure white. That's totally okay. Um, I believe my uh, student said that you can purchase alginate from uh, Hobby Lobby and a couple of different craft supply stores. So be on the lookout, um, ask employees if they carry it. If not, you might have to special order it online. Um, one thing you wanna be mindful of in terms of material handling and safety is that this is a powder material, which means it can become airborne with any powdered material that can become airborne. You always wanna make sure that you're wearing an M95 dust mask because you do not want to inhale these materials. Like I said, these are transformative materials that undergo a uh, chemical reaction when they encounter moisture and water, which means that if you inhale this material into your body, your human body, which is made up of about 95% water, bad things will happen. So try to always make sure that you wear a dust mask when you handle materials like this and or plaster um, so that you're protecting, you know, your insides, your lungs. Uh, the whole point of this stuff is that it turns solid when it in, encounters liquid. We don't want that chemical reaction to happen inside of your body. All right, so bear with me if you can't hear me. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna pre-measure out some alginate and then I'm gonna pour some water into the alginate. We're gonna give it a mix. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, it sets up, has a good smooth consistency. I will transfer and pour that into my little cutoff Gatorade bottle. And then we will plunge my face into it and then we're gonna wait a couple of minutes. Um, and after usually about four to eight minutes, we should be able to demold from here, at which point I would highly recommend that you immediately mix up whatever your casting material is. Usually that's gonna be plaster and just immediately pour that into the mold. The thing about alginate is, is that it is time-based. Um, you don't wanna make an alginate mold and then walk away from it uh, for a long period of time uh, and then pour your casting material into it. Um, because the water will eventually start seeping back out of the alginate and your mold will dry out and it won't be usable anymore. So it can't be reused an infinite amount of times, but if you go ahead and just work quickly in a single session, you can get one or two castings out of an alginate mold. All right, I'm going under. I'll just use the larger bucket here.
So you'll notice I'm not mixing it up all the way. I'm not filling the whole container. I want to have some room for the water. Uh, a whole lot of material and or water displacement doesn't happen with this. Uh, and the reason being is that this material just basically becomes one with the water. Um, so you're not going to see that material level rise very much. This is about how much material we're going to get. Come on, buddy. And I will usually mix half of the water and then I'll add more if I need to. Because I'm trying not to throw all that dust around. I'm also going to do this down here. Sorry guys, I took it off camera there for a little bit, but as you can see, it's got kind of a, a, a thick milkshake consistency, um, which is good. That's what we want. We want it relatively smooth, but we still want it pourable, right? So we've gotten rid of the dust, which means that um, we can take our dust mask off and now we can pour our lovely little cup of alginate and we're ready to actually make a casting. Jack, you want to make a casting in your mouth? Maybe. I got, I got enough to do too. I was going to tell Jack to do it. All right, we ready?
Right, guys so as you can see you know we are able to to get kind of a quick and dirty weird little mold out of a Gatorade bottle and I would say a relatively small amount of alginate that you could easily purchase from like a Hobby Lobby store um, but you know I had some excess material that was still left in the bucket and I do not like to waste materials so we made a small weird little fingertip mold that we can use and then we have you know uh, a, a, a chin kind of like mouth mold that we can use I think I had my tongue out we'll see how that turns out um but yeah in general it's a quick and easy way to make a mold I think in general uh that probably took about 10 minutes and we already have you know two workable molds that we could probably get if we're careful um, two to three castings out of each. Uh, one thing you want to be mindful of, uh, there, you'll notice I didn't measure or do a direct ratio <laughs> of powder to water. Uh, in general, it's about equal. You're going to be using just about as much water as you're using powder by volume. Now you'll notice that the powder actually holds a lot of like air into it. It's very fluffy. So you want to make sure you're packing down your powder to get an accurate measurement of how much water you're actually going to need. Now, I don't trust actual strict measurements. I go by feel. So that's what you were seeing in the demo, which is I saw that it was a little bit too thick and chunky, and therefore I added more water, right? Now, I was only doing it a little bit at a time. The reason for that is I can uh, always add more water, I cannot take it back once I have started mixing it in there. So just be mindful of that. If you're going to add a little bit more moisture, do a little bit at a time. But again, this is a time-based thing, so you still got to work relatively quickly. Um, now, this little bit that dripped out uh, onto my arm is an excellent example of what I mean when I say that we capture data but not form. You'll see how kind of floppy and, and non-rigid this is, right? But if you get up close to it, you will see that it's captured every single uh, cell, cell structure, line, crevice, small little indentation on my skin. Um, and that's because this is an archival based uh, kind of forensic material that they use to capture details of the human body. It's not archival, it's forensic. So that forensic level detail is in the alginate, but alginate means nothing if you don't have a good mother mold. All right, guys, that's the material I would, you know, kind of play around with if, if I was in y'all's shoes and doing this project. Uh, I love life casting, I love mold making, I love thinking about how I can take the human body and, and transform it and combine it with other things, and I hope you all do too. Glenn? That was great. Ugh.
turn off your gum in a minute. It's in your mouth. Whenever your live casting is best if you can work with a partner. Um, this allows you to have more control over your material manipulation, but also uh, it prevents you from having to worry about juggling multiple processes while also being your own model, while also staying still and not putting yourself in danger. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do uh, a brief example of a layup mold uh, using alginate as a data collecting material and we're going to use some plaster bandage as the mother mold. Uh, this by all means is not a uh, comprehensive demo, but it's simply meant to show you what I mean when I say that you need to create a hard shell on top of the uh, more flexible alginate. Uh, this can be applied to doing larger, uh, larger base molds. You can do an entire face casting, or you can do torso type uh, mold pieces. Um, this is just meant to show you on a small scale an example of what I mean when I use the term a layup mold using alginate as a casting material. All right, Jack, you want to hold your arm over here for me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get this mixed up. And the bright side of doing a layup mold is that you don't have to use as much material, right? Because you're only putting it on in a thin layer. Um, so you're not wasting, you know, an entire bucket full of material. You can get a larger surface area using a smaller amount of material because you just need it to be thick enough that it doesn't tear, um, but, you know, thin enough that you can kind of cover large swaths of material um, pretty quickly. Uh, and actually, Jack, I'm going to have you put a mold release on here. Alginate most likely won't stick to your hair, but we want to be careful. So it's good to get into the practice of using, say, a Vaseline as a mold release, just in case some of the material tries to hug on to any body hair on whatever part you're doing a mold of. So I'm going to get you some of that right now. All right, so look mm -hmm. up your arm, man. While he's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and start our alginate mix. Yeah. So I'm going to put the thinnest amount of, of Vaseline. I just want just enough. If it could be like one molecule of Vaseline covering each hair, because you can see the hairs on my hand, it probably would capture them. But let's say, and we'll talk about this later, if you were doing a bit more of a face mold and my beard hairs, and especially the... the um, eyelashes and that kind of thing, they really get caught in, and especially head hair will just get tangled in in a way that will get caught in the mold. And more likely, especially with this, with alginate, it'll tear the mold as you pull off from uh, the hairs. And so you won't get a good mold. I'm going, I've gone for such a thin coating, it's more like I've applied it like sunscreen. Whereas if you were doing Vaseline around maybe the, you know, the, the edge of your hair, you would probably err on the side of a thicker coating just to really, really gloop it in, cover it, and make sure that the alginate can't get underneath your hairs. Right. Okay, and as you guys can see, like I said, you can totally mix this by hand using a mixing stick. I'm actually getting really good results just by doing this by hand in a small little bowl, you know. That being said, you know, I'm being very thorough. I'm scraping all of the sides. I'm making sure that, you know, we're not getting any clumps in the material and that I'm not missing any dry pockets of material within the bucket. So this is looking nice and creamy. So we're gonna go ahead and apply this on Jack. And I'm gonna actually- Oh no, that's leg wax. I'm gonna actually just use the, the mixing stick as an application material. And you can kind of see it's already like kind of thick um, and setting up. It'll, we're not getting a ton of material sort of like migrating, which is great. But one of the reasons why it's not doing that is because uh, 
Jack is not holding his arm up vertically. If he were to just all of a sudden raise his hand as if he had a question, uh, we would have a different story. Gravity would be working us against us in that scenario. Don't do that. Um, so we want to make sure we're working with a horizontal kind of flat area. Um, and that way we're not fighting gravity as much as um, we could be fighting it. But even then, you kind of see we're getting a lot of material that's kind of like falling down. Um, which is fine. You, there's a certain sacrifice to the mold making gods that is going to happen uh, with viscous materials like this. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, you just accept that and then you continue to work with the material and redeposit it um, as it sort of moves along. It will reach, like I said, this is a transformative material. So it will reach that part of the pot life where you'll notice it becomes more rigid and that gravity uh, pull becomes sort of less and less. So can we scoop it up from there yes. and put it back on? Yes, you can. So as long as it's in that sweet spot, that sort of liquid zone, we can actually continue to grab the material and plop it back on top. Now, a thing that you want to be mindful of is that some of the time you're actually grabbing weight and putting it on top of material that may already be setting. So you only want to do that sort of a finite amount of times because you don't want to get to that point where the material is almost entirely set and then you put a bunch of weight on top of it and then it's just going to drag and pull down. So like I'm very mindful of sort of the timing of this. I can already tell that we're approaching that no return zone. And you can feel it in the viscosity of the material. Like you'll notice when it starts to travel less. Like even right now, you can sort of see it's kind of like baking, right? So whenever you're mixing something and it starts to hold its shape, so this is actually sticking to my hand rather than dropping down onto Jack. I would say that's the sweet spot. That's the, that's the zone of no return. And that's what I usually say, hands up. Don't touch it anymore. Don't do anything. Wait, wait until it sets up. Um, wait until your test batch, AKA the stuff that is down here can be sort of like touched without sticking to you or even let's say if you did a hand application like I did just now uh, wait until this seems like it's relatively ready to come off of your hand and then you can start applying your plaster bandage now uh, you might be wondering like okay well how is this gonna stay into the rigid mold um, and and not just kind of flop around the rigid mold what I like to do, and we didn't have any today, but what I like to do is that as this layer of alginate is actually setting up and, 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 and getting to that point of rigidity, I actually will take cotton balls and I'll plop a couple down. Mm. And, uh, and basically the cotton ball acts as the bridge between the alginate and the plaster. And so I will build the plaster mother mold around the cotton balls and it basically just takes the two materials and makes sure that they kind of stay together. Um, but I didn't have any cotton balls in my studio today, so you guys will want to add that to your shopping list if this is something that intrigues you and that you want to try out. So for doing a large surface area like this, um, some notes for your model. Choose someone you can trust to stay still, because let's say, for example, even, if, even now probably, but in that, in that moment when the when the alginate's curing, if I were to move, move my wrist up and down like this or so, or move my hand a little bit, then I would be ruining the potential mold as it, uh, whilst it's being made. So you need to try, try to have someone who can stay perfectly stock still. Now, whoever that is, I would also warn them what they're getting into. This stuff is cold and slimy, kind of gross. And maybe while we're doing this, we could talk about one area people might want to be taking molds of is the face. Now we haven't done a demo of that right now 
I think that's something we're recommending that if you want to do that, you work with your professor in your classes to do and have that hands-on instruction because it's a little bit more complicated. You get, you know, a lot more detail. There's a lot more going on on our faces than there is on our arms in terms of like facial features, our eyes, nose, mouth. But that's what makes it difficult because you don't want to start using alginate on someone's mouth, eyes, yeah, mouth and nose unless you prepared to not block their breathing ways. So you want to make sure you're keeping their breathing ways open. But especially, I would warn your model that having this cold, slimy stuff on their face, and then as we're going to get into now, building the mother mold over the top, it's a long process, takes quite a while. And if someone feels um, starts feeling claustrophobic, you, you know, warn them of that because they just kind of have this thing pressed on their face for a long, long time. So it can make people, people feel uncomfortable. So check in with your model, make sure that they're comfortable with these, these kind of things going on. I always say that you have to have a method of communication with your models, um, which can be hard, right? Especially if you're doing a casting of their face. If they can't communicate the way that they normally would. Um, so I always go through with my model before any material gets applied to them and just let them know like, okay, we are gonna communicate with hand signals. Thumbs up means everything is okay. I'm doing great. Uh, a sideways thumb means uh, this is a little bit weird, but I'm willing to go forward. I can, I can breathe, but you know, please hurry. And then a thumbs down means get me out of this right now. I can't breathe, please, for the love of God get me out of this, right? So they know what those three levels mean. And uh, as the person who's actually applying the material, you're making sure that you're checking in with them really often, right? Not only uh, communicating exactly what you're doing and when you're doing it to them, because they can't see, but um, just letting them know like, okay, we're on this stage. Okay, I'm gonna move to the plaster right now. We're almost done. A little bit of encouragement, a little bit of communication goes a long way when it comes to stuff like this. Jack made an excellent point. You want to make sure that they can sit still without shifting for a long period of time. Uh, you can set yourself up for success by, I don't know, finding a comfortable place, uh, a comfortable position for your model to actually sit down and rest while they're in position. Jack, you can keep your hand straight while also sitting down. That'd so I brought Jack a chair. <laughs> um, so he's going to sit um, and, and, and kind of rest while I'm doing the rest of this process. Uh, so right now, what we're going to do is we're just going to apply some plaster strip pieces to what we have here. Uh, I have some that are pre-cut um, and stacked. I will cut various shapes and sizes. Um, these are a little bit small, but they'll work for what we're doing today. Uh, I will roll out plaster bandage uh, on top of one another to where I have three, uh, three sheets high and I will cut pieces in stacks of three and I will position them so that every single time I'm picking up uh, uh, a piece of plaster bandage, I'm actually picking up three pieces of plaster bandage. Why do you think I would do that, Jack? Because you're a nerd. I am a nerd. Uh, but also, one of the reasons why I'm doing that is I'm working three times faster, um, which means that I can get my model uh, covered three times quicker, uh, which means that the live casting process goes a lot faster. So they don't have to be uncomfortable for as long. Is there a reason you wouldn't just do a whole sheet over this? Uh, I didn't prepare and cut that out, so we're just working what we have today. Okay. Um, that and the little overlaps uh, add a little bit of strength and rigidity. So, I mean, we also didn't do your fingers, so this is kind of, it feels like a moot point of a mold. Who does an arm and no fingers? But also for the GoPro team at home, they can see how I apply multiple layers, mm -hmm. which can be applied. That knowledge is golden. I'll probably have to cut some more. But they can see how to overlap it, which is good for them to know. Kind of looks like you have medieval armor on. Yeah. 
Well, I'll just pop on down the road to the Ren Fair after this. I don't think it's open yet. <laughs> I think that's a September thing. Oh, okay, okay, well. I'll just leave it on for a bit. You also notice that I'm making a mess. Uh, if I were my student, I would have told me to put down plastic before I do this. How would you approach this project? That just pull one big piece. Not this specific <laughs> mold that we're doing. <laughs> I'm gonna fast forward this bit in the video and then bully you in the captions. <laughs> this is where Emily was getting really mad. Um, also, she could have done I mean, it infinitely just faster. Tiny little bits. I don't care. Well, yeah, I would do that with a much larger piece, too, but this is more informative in terms of layering. Well, it's, you know, when I realized we were going to be doing this, I, uh, I was like, oh, well, we're doing it on camera. It just, it just got it in my head. I just wanted to do a, just get a big mold of a big bottom, really. <laughs> a big probably, bottom. yeah. <laughs> um, What's the what's the found out? What are you combining with a bottom? Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, not sure whether it'd be like I stick the bottom on something. You just yeah, then you just have you just have a mold of bum. You could stick on things like the mailbox. You just put bum on it. Um, <laughs> just hang it off. You just like on the side of your car. Just have a, a big Tom, a big ass. The coming, Tom Green approach. Just right on the bonnet of the car. Just have an ass. Just driving towards people. I guess it's actually going to do the very exact amount that we needed. Especially because here in Pennsylvania, people don't need um, the the front license plate. Yeah. So you can just have that. You can have that just covering the whole front of your car. Just put a butt on just it. A big butt. Be covering flies. The as front. You drive the down front the is the front is the bottom. But yeah, maybe yeah. What could be coming out of the butt? Who knows? Just a drill. This drill just stuck right up into it. I think the paddle shooting out of it, spinning. <laughs> that would be a great. Yeah, I, I think that's it. That's the sculpture. Churning. <laughs> churning. Yeah, that's what I'd call it. Churning. That's what the piece would be called. Churning. If I was. Submitting to Sculpture X, it would be. I'd put a butt on it. An ass. Okay. Um, so you'll kind of see me like massaging and rubbing this. Uh, it's it's not because I like Jack so much. Uh, it's because I'm trying to activate the plaster. I mean, you're great and everything, but um, the more you kind of manipulate plaster, um, you're actually agitating it, which is kind of allowing those chemical bonds and reactions to, to happen quicker. Not only that, you're also filling in the cells of the plaster bandage. You can kind of see there's like little squares, little pockets of, pockets of nothing that you want to fill in with material. So anytime I'm doing this, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm filling in all of those cells and pockets and uh, getting a nice smooth coating um, and that everything is going to laminate together evenly now when the plaster bandage has gone i can't see it on that side but i feel like for many of the people participating in this project doing this method they're gonna we have only done sort of roughly one side of the arm yes but people might want to go all the way around if for people going you know going more than halfway around your arm and do it creating those undercuts how would does the plaster bandage bend? Is there a certain point where they can like they could tease it off, get it off, or if someone's gone all the way around, you know, how do you get it off after then? Or do you just have to make one on one side and one on the other? So we've done mostly just half of the arm here. Uh, what I would do is if let's say we wanted to do the other the other side, if we had full coverage all the way uh, around Jack's arm, let's say he dipped it in uh, alginate and we got some nice coverage on the other side too. 
Uh, what I would do is I would do half. I would allow it to set up um, until it's relatively dry. And then I would take some of that Vaseline and I would put it on the seams, the end seams on whatever the halfway point is uh, all along the entire perimeter. And I would be really generous with that Vaseline. And then you can actually overlay plaster on top of that and create a really nice um, sort of two, two halves that sort of seat together really well. And then right before you take the two solid halves off of each other, I usually use a Sharpie. I'll draw a couple of lines. That way I know where they should connect back together. And uh, yeah, and then I'll just try to draft both sides off in opposite directions and then put them back together. Um, every once in a while, you know, especially when you're starting out, you might not draft it perfectly on halfway points. Um, so you might have to try to flex your plaster a little bit. This is key to why you don't want to go too thick with the plaster bandage, um, primarily because you don't want to create a scenario that you can't cut yourself out of, right? So you make it thick enough that it's rigid and it acts as a mother mold. This is getting nice and kind of like rigid now, which is good. Um, however, it's thin enough that I should be able to get away with uh, kind of snipping or cutting an area if I need to. Um, there are some areas, uh, let's say like if it's not something that is going to meet up with a second half, um, like a bottom and top that I might reinforce and make a little bit thicker um, by just adding an extra layer of the strips. So like if I know that I'm going to be pouring material into one side, I might beef up that one corner. Um, but that's because I know that I don't need to, to kind of connect it with anything. Um, and that's just to add a little bit of almost like little ribs that add rigidity onto stuff. I'm not putting it along the whole thing, but I'm creating like an area that is a little bit stronger than others. Okay, this is setting up. And I might... I think I'm just gonna add like one long piece, like you said, on top of here, just to tie everything together. And this new plaster bandage will adhere really nicely, or really want to adhere to this uh, uh, the plaster bandage that's already gone on. And that's why you need to Vaseline if you're doing two parts. The Vaseline forms that barrier so that the plaster bandage will not stick to the other plaster bandage if you're making a, a two-part color mold. Yeah, we refer to it as a mold release, um, specifically for that reason, because it allows things to release from one another. But similarly, if you got Vaseline on your hands and then you were touching your molds and that kind of stuff, and then you wanted to put more on, if you didn't accidentally cover the outside of your mold in Vaseline, then it would be contaminated and you wouldn't be able to put more plaster bandage on. So watch out, make sure that things things don't mix that you don't want them to mix. And in these messy processes that you are able to keep things separate enough. I've moved my fingers so much. <laughs> That's fine. We didn't capture any data on the fingers. So. Uh, one thing uh, that I will tell you, you know, I'm adding a couple of final pieces uh, that was feeling a little bit thin. Um, as it was setting up, it still felt a little bit thin. Uh, don't, you don't have to add a ton of material to increase a little bit of rigidity. Like you see, these are singular layers. These, these are kind of paper thin, um, but just inherently because it's going in a opposite direction and it's all one piece that's adding an infinite amount of rigidity and kind of strength to it um, just because it's actually facing a different orientation. So a little bit goes a long way. Plus look how smooth it is, it's like butter. And then now we should be able to let that set up and then be able to pop Jack's arm out of here pretty soon. Uh, one thing that I do want to remind you of that we didn't talk about when we were talking about doing the alginate plunge molds in a bucket. Um, 
alginate is completely and totally safe to kind of submerge your hand into, but uh, you never want to do that with any other material um, that isn't alginate. Um, let's say, particularly, I believe the example you came up with was plaster of Paris or any type of gypsum-based material. You would never want to do this with plaster because plaster, like I said, is a rigid material and you cannot just slip your hand back out of that uh, once it sets up. This is, a, this is a flexible material and so you're able to squeeze your hand out of this, but you would never want to apply uh, the same type of process or logic to a rigid material. Seems like a no-brainer, but I always like to, like to point it out because I usually get at least one question uh, similar to that every single semester. And you were talking about how flexible this material is. Uh, with it thin like this, it will actually flex a little bit, not a ton, but there is some wiggle room, especially when there's still a small amount of moisture in here. Mm. You can kind of flex it just a little bit, which you will kind of see. Um, right now, I'm just kind of like, going underneath here and I'm seeing if I can release some of the alginate. So again, Jack had hair on his arms. So what I am doing is just trying to get just underneath the alginate to try to release some of the hair. Because the alginate should be set. So we're gonna see if we can take the alginate and the plaster off simultaneously. But we have to kind of help it along a little bit because there's a little bit of arm here. We're okay? Yeah. All right. I just hope I put enough uh, Vaseline on, especially for when I got plaster on my arm. I'm sorry, I'm attempting to take this all off in like a single piece. There you go, there's your arm. Woo! Look at that, we got a couple of little air bubbles, but all in all, not too bad. And as you can see, it just kind of sits lightly in here, so you could very easily paint some plaster into the material and get, um, you know, about a half to three quarters of a human arm, <laughs> which if you're doing a relief sculpture, might be exactly what you needed. <laughs> And this process as well, I think it's, it's ended up with less uh, bubbles, easier to get the bubbles out when you're doing the layup process than if you're doing the submerging process because it's going on in that thin layer, it has that chance for the bubbles to escape and you're, you're working that surface. Um, and so, yeah, supposedly uh, something that can help uh, cut down on those bubbles even more so is if you start with uh, a body part that already is wet. So if mm. it has water on it, it will cut the surface tension uh, even more so. So if we ran your arm under the water first after you Vaseline, we might have gotten even less bubbles. We could have had a perfect cast, but um, not everybody remembers to do that every single time. Um, but yeah, so that's the basic premise of, a, of an alginate layup mold. Like I said, uh, I typically will try to put a cotton ball or two in between these two layers. It helps just lock them together. Uh, but not everybody likes to do that. Um, there's, there's a million different ways to do everything, um, and this is just one of them. So you can apply this kind of logic to doing much larger parts um, of the body. Uh, if you have any more questions or you want to learn more about it, um, reach out to your instructor.